You've reached Hotel Pacifico, your five-star destination for BC Politicos. Press 4 for room service. Press the star key for your hosts, Mike McDonald and Kate Hammer. Welcome back, guests. It's a busy week, I'm sure, for all of us. Uh, we're recording this today on uh, a throne speech day. Uh, and uh, Jeff, I know you're getting ready to head out to Victoria. I'm going to go tomorrow morning and uh, get over there in time for the budget. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. So we are planning... Jeff and Mike will be on on the scene, uh, and we are planning listeners to get you some uh, some content, some budget analysis con analysis content promptly on Thursday when the budget lands. So keep your eye out for that. Yeah, proof of the subtitle of our show, which is that Mike and I are going back to Victoria for the budget <laughs> lockup, which means that it's like that hotel where you can check out but you can never leave. You never leave. We're haunting the place. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Sorry. And I'm only I'm I'm recording from Ontario this week. Otherwise, I'd be joining you and to witness the ghosts of chiefs of staff past. Uh, but I think uh, I think a little bit of analysis from the two of you will 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 satisfy uh, a lot of political appetite. So I look forward to that. Today's episode, I'm very excited uh, for today's episode. We have a guest, we have Kim Bolin joining us. She's an award-winning crime reporter for the Vancouver Sun and one of Canada's top investigative reporters. She recently published a five-part series, Lethal Exports, which exposes Canada and particularly BC's outside role, outsized role in the international drug trade. Thanks for joining us, Kim. Thanks for having me. I'm welcome. wondering, yeah, welcome. Welcome to Hotel Pacifico. I'm I'm wondering, Kim, because it's interesting. I was reading this, uh, reading your series and sort of reflecting. I know you've been on the crime beat for a while now. Um, and I'm wondering for you, just going back a bit, <laughs> covering the crime beat, was there a moment where you sort of, your perspective maybe shift from, okay, I'm a crime reporter working for the Vancouver Sun in BC to like, I am working in a sparsely populated province of 5 million people that is punching way above its weight and, you know, that the threads come back to way more frequently than its size would dictate. Um, was there a moment for you, I guess, that the, it became sort of um, a beat where you realized you were really at the epicenter of something international? I think so. I mean, I think covering the Air India bombing case for decades sort of prepared me for this because there we had a local story, you know, that obviously had major international connections and covering that story over the years when there was a lot more resources available to journalists. I, you know, got to travel uh, to India several times to look at the roots of that. So, you know, something I always try to do, you know, you know, think globally, act locally or whatever the, the saying is. Uh, I try to do that with journalism, uh, but certainly on the organized crime beat, you know, I saw going back uh, really more than a decade, you know, you'd have a BC guy murdered while he was in Mexico. And it yeah. was a coincidence. There was another one uh, who decades earlier had been involved in the kidnapping of Jimmy Patterson's daughter, who was murdered by his own gang in Argentina. So you would hear these bits about people uh, getting caught up in something nefarious overseas and you do the best you can with the phone and, you know, now through the internet to get as much information about what's going on abroad, but obviously to have the ability to travel there and see what was going on, um, you know, really opened my eyes to just how big a role we are in fact playing internationally. Yeah, Kim, when you did this series, which is really remarkable and covers so much ground, uh, both geographically and from a story standpoint, where there were a couple of key takeaways that you were surprised by when you sat back and started to write? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, learning from law enforcement people I interviewed all over the place uh, that, you know, these groups that pretend to be warring at home are all cooperating at the top levels internationally so they can make as much money as possible was a bit eye opening, you know, like I thought, well, you know, the Hells Angels hate the UN gang, uh, you know, we've seen lots of violence on our streets related to that conflict. But really, you know, at the top, they are international entrepreneurs who want to make as much money as possible. So, you know, it's pretty frustrating when you see so many young guys getting gunned down or getting charged with murder when they're like 19 or 20 years old, because they think they're repping, you know, the colors of their organization and doing the right thing by taking out a rival. 
when at the top level, you know, I mean, I don't know if they're sitting back and laughing, but that's how I envision them, you know, as the billions of dollars roll in, right? So, so that was pretty shocking, uh, I think. I and wanna, I just wanna thank you, Kim, for that insight in the piece. Like I, reading that part and the heart you brought, I think, to understanding that cruel, the cruelty of that fact. And I say this as someone, it was like a, it like, it hit me in the heart when I read that part of the 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 piece um as someone who was a crime reporter too right and i and i just remember you covered again and again these young kids dying and i'm struck by how much the lack of sympathy sometimes we have for these guys who um you know often you know weren't set up for success in the first place um and and just uh and then to have them be serving these um bosses who for whom they really are pawns too, who will price fix, I couldn't believe it, uh, and collaborate on that level. And then literally the lives of these young men are collateral at the other end of that. I Sorry, I just wanted to pause and say, I really appreciated you bringing that to the fore. I think it's a really important point. Yeah, no, I appreciate you saying that. And it's true that people don't have much sympathy for them. I don't know how many times I've, you know, tweeted out my story of the day about somebody dying or somebody being charged. And you get like the whole good riddance crowd, you know, who just don't care. And I feel like we've had so much success over the last decade in making humanizing drug users and uh, understanding, you know, mental health issues that are involved and kind of treating them somewhat differently. But that hasn't transitioned over into people that get caught up in gangs and get abused and misused by people who are making a lot of money off the efforts of those young guys who are selling locally. So it's something I care about. I, I would love to shift the public attitude. I don't think I've done it yet. <laughs> uh, you're setting a high bar for yourself. No, I want to say, I think I'm remembering, you know, covering, you know, shootings uh, when I was back in New York. And at the stage that we found out the victim, you know, was armed or connected, it was, is it a news story? Uh, and I remember covering it in Toronto and, you know, hearing about um, uh, young kids, 16, 17, who were arrested in connection with shootings, who, you know, police couldn't find a parent uh, to to connect with um, and to to talk to about this, like, young kids. Um, and I, 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 your point, though, I think is really interesting. And I, and I, I see it in this piece, this case you're trying to make for why we all need to care very much about 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 organized crime and 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 the gang wars and we need to care about it on a human level um i want to this is going to be kind of a big question but I, like what's your sense of why it's so hard to get people to care because i think we only care about we what we think directly impacts our lives right and it's human nature i understand that uh, honestly, it was a bit frustrating for me a few years back when suddenly everyone's all like, oh, money laundering, money laundering is so bad. Money laundering is bad, but it's a byproduct, you know, of the drug trade, right? And nobody cares about who's involved in the drug trade, but they care about money laundering because the impression was that it was impacting real estate prices. So that, you know, affects middle class people. And so suddenly it's like money laundering, money laundering. But you can't tackle one little element of what is a very complex major problem, right? You have to look at it holistically and come up with better solutions. And the the recent example that honestly made me want to scream was, you know, yeah, there's a problem in Ontario with SUVs being stolen, right? right. You know? So yeah, it right. cost a lot of money. And gee, the insurance industry was all up in arms. So suddenly the federal government is racing to hold a forum, you know, where they're like, oh, wow, SUVs, they're going out of the Port of Montreal, like organized crime is behind this. Let's do something. So they have this forum very quickly and they didn't come up with any decent solutions. Like it's like, oh, we need uh, harsher penalties for people stealing the cars. Okay, well, right, you know, from the top, that's the lowest level. That's the poorest person in the food chain, you know, who you're gonna like throw stiffer penalties at. What about putting port police back at the Port of Montreal? What about trying to target transnational organized crime with complex investigations that actually lead to charges being laid, right? So it, it, we pay lip service when there's a little blip on the radar and people pretend they care for a little while. You know, I've seen that so many times in BC. Well, there'll be, you know, a whole bunch of shootings in a short period of time. 
you know, so a federal minister will visit, throw some money at it. You know, there'll be all these people talking at a news conference. And then two months later, nothing has changed and no effort has really been made to deal with what some of the underlying core issues are. Well, related to that, actually, sorry, uh, I'll just, um, the, the, I'm thinking of you recently outside of the series, um, through FOI, I think you got access to a report looking at BC's anti-gang agency, um, at finding that it was, um, ineffective and, and didn't provide value for money. Can you, can you tell me a little bit about what that was saying and if it pointed to where we can truly do better, what we can fix? Well, they did make a number of recommendations. They were trying to get, um, you know, the anti-gang agency to work more on gang murder investigations. But in fact, those are handled by, uh, for the most part, unless they take place in Vancouver, the inter, uh, the uh, integrated homicide investigation team, which is generally RCMP led, right? So that, you know, we have a lot of silos here in BC when it comes to policing. Of course, now we're creating one more silo because, you know, RCMP is leaving Surrey for Surrey Police Services. We do really need to look at our whole model of policing nationally, but also provincially, right? Because we do have a lot of balkanization. It does impact investigations, even when there is a lot of goodwill between agencies. And sometimes there's less goodwill, right? So, uh, CFSAU is sort of running around after the lower level, mid level gangsters. They have had some success uh, with investigations resulting in charges and convictions. Where they haven't had a lot of success is targeting the top players uh, in the province internationally, right? So you're never going to change what's happening at the mid and lower level unless you deal with what's happening at the top. And these guys know they can get away with anything and they do get away with anything and everything, right? So it's generally a problem. Um, it was really interesting to go to Australia and see, you know, the Australian federal police, they don't have any responsibility for municipal policing anywhere except the capital, Canberra. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, they're focused on these bigger players, these major investigations. They go after Australians, internationally if they're involved in organized crime within Australia and they go after other kingpins internationally including the head of Sam Gore, Se Chai Lop, who is a Canadian um, and as I learned when I uh, traveled over there his right hand man is also a Canadian who grew up in Abbotsford and who I had covered uh, you know for many years uh, before he became such a high level player so I want to stop up. there. Just... Sorry, one one thing because I think we while we're on on the topic of him, I think I was reading it and I think I looked over at my partner and said, "The Asian uh, El Chapo is Canadian." Like <laughs> it's such a surprising. I think you phrase it almost like that in the piece. Like it's such a surprising thing that that we you keep coming back to these 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 people from Abbotsford and from the Fraser Valley and just broadly like. It's amazing how frequently that happens. Um, yeah, yeah, and there, there is something that I found in common with all these guys. Often they had uh, a failed prosecution in BC courts, right? So, you know, you have to wonder that, you know, could the trajectory of some of these people's lives been different, you know, if they'd been held accountable at an early stage of their criminality, right? you know, it's impossible to know. Uh, but when you get away with a lot at home, and then you just keep moving up the food chain, uh, you know, you have to wonder, you know, why we failed as a society, and we did fail. You know, I, I think getting back to what you were asking about why people don't care, we see all, all uh, the people involved in organized crime as sort of individuals who've made bad decisions. Right. But again, it's way more complicated than that. There are many layers to it. And some of them are definitely societal and community and judicial system failings. Kim, I think you really daylighted as well what was starting to dawn on me, but was brought home by your piece, which is that we don't just receive and distribute drugs to uh, British Columbians with devastating consequences in the case of the fentanyl crisis, we produce and export drugs to other jurisdictions like methamphetamines to Australia and so on. Um, what do you think is needed uh, to stop uh, these top criminals from feeling that BC is a safe place to do not just local trade, but international um, sales? 
Well, I, I think some legislative changes uh, to toughen things up when you're dealing with the highest levels would be a great place to start. But I don't even see the conversation going there. You know, why don't we have some some kind of RICO legislation where, uh, you know, people involved in transnational organized crime, you know, even if they're on the periphery can face some consequences, right? Because we, we, we don't target, if we're not going to target, you know, the biggest players, we're certainly not going to target the enablers, right? That's kind of how they're seeing the criminal enablers. And for example, right now, we have a whole bunch of trusted insiders, as they're called, uh, at the Port of Vancouver, uh, at the Port of Montreal. And these are people who are willing to work with organized crime, whether they're directly involved, as in the case of many Hells Angels who work as longshore workers, or others who've been convicted of uh, drug smuggling uh, to and from the United States and then get their jobs at the port back right away. Uh, no security clearance for the vast majority of port workers there. So some people are directly involved and some people are just paid off on the side. Uh, you know, they work for the shipping companies. Uh, they they work right on the docks. You know, uh, in other countries, there have been examples of law enforcement that has been paid off. We've seen that a a few times here in BC over the years. Fortunately, there have been successful prosecutions when that's been the case. Uh, so, you know, we we really have to look at the whole system. And when I saw like the, you know, whatever it was, one day seminar on stolen SUVs, and they come up with the very bare bones recommendation, you know, and nobody's saying, well, wait a minute, you know, the car thieves are, you know, probably drug users who have issues, right, who are feeding into a much bigger uh, organized crime chain, why aren't we going at the people who are actually organizing uh, what's going on? And well, I had the same reaction, but we have a fentanyl crisis now in the province where the rate of death is, is bigger than from fentanyl. It's bigger from all other uh, causes. It's a huge increase. And yet, as you say, it still hasn't triggered that kind of reaction that you get with stolen cars. Well, I think, though, Jeff, part of that, too, and, you know, I think we in the media have to take a look in the mirror because, you know, I feel like the fentanyl crisis has been portrayed generally in the media by something that's being done to us here in Canada by, you know, mm -hmm. people, bad people in uh, China or in Mexico, yeah. you know, and we're the victims of it because it's being sent here. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's just so wrong. Uh, it's, you know, w even when fentanyl has been coming in from China. And that's shifted dramatically, as you said, we're now producing a lot here. Uh, a lot of it's also been coming from Mexico, but again, we're producing a lot here. It, it's at the request of transnational organized criminals, uh, Canadians based overseas, and many of them right here uh, in British Columbia and other parts of Canada, right? So again, if you're looking at um, you know, importation, you don't see a lot of importation charges laid, period. Uh, so, you know, when you see people that are being charged with trafficking fentanyl, they're at the most mid-level players, and usually they're low-level players and often drug users themselves. So that's, you know, that's a subsistence drug uh, trafficker who is just trying to survive, right? So, you know, why aren't we going after the biggest players? Um we are doing it through civil forfeiture cases, but you know I'm starting to see so many repeat civil forfeiture cases that it doesn't appear to be much of a deterrence, right? It's just become kind of the cost of doing business. Maybe explain what that is for people who aren't familiar with the term. Yeah, you know, BC, like other provinces, has civil forfeiture legislation. It came in in 2006, and it's a way that the government can target the assets that they believe uh, come from organized crime or really any kind of crime. Uh, so they might seize a car if, you know, a drug trafficker is driving around in that car to sell drugs. Uh, there there uh, can be a criminal prosecution, but there doesn't have to be a criminal prosecution in order for a file to be transferred to the civil forfeiture office. And they then file a civil case, which, of course, is a much lower uh, threshold in order to you know have success in a court, right? It's just the balance of probabilities. So uh, the civil forfeiture office is seizing a lot of property. Uh, they are seeing more challenges now. Uh, you know, in the initial years, there weren't a lot of challenges. A lot of people would just let the property go. Um, and sometimes we are seeing sort of major players having a bunch of property seized. Uh, of course, the biggest case, uh, which uh, they had success with just it only took, uh, let's see, 13, four, 15 years, and that was 
uh, trying to seize three Hells Angels clubhouses, which uh, they finally uh, succeeded in doing uh, in 2022. And uh, the Supreme Court of Canada wouldn't hear uh, an appeal by the Hells Angels of that. So those clubhouses are now um, with the government. But that one was pretty symbolic. I mean, the actual value of the properties was a fraction on, of what the legal bills would have been in that case. So civil forfeiture is a tool. Uh, we also now are just starting to have unexplained wealth orders. Same thing. A court can order someone to have to explain how they, you know, have like four Ferraris in their driveway when they don't have a job. Uh, so I think these are good things, uh, but they do face some court challenges. Ultimately, however, if people don't feel like they're going to be criminally prosecuted, I don't think they're that fearful of being caught. Well, this is this is another piece that was really interesting. Like, I, I think you illuminated some of why these cases are hard to prosecute in Canada. Can you can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, well, you know, again, I talked to a lot of people in law enforcement, but um, and some ex law enforcement and, and other legal experts as well. But you continually hear Stinchcomb, which is a, yes. a 1991 Supreme Court of Canada decision on disclosure, which, you know, says the Crown has to disclose everything to a defendant, even if it's not evidence in the trial. And, you know, you think about how much things have changed since uh, yeah. the early 90s. And, you know, cases are extremely complicated. There's often all kinds of electronic evidence. Uh, there might be wiretaps. There might be international intelligence. And there can literally be millions and millions and millions of documents and pages of evidence that all has to be disclosed, right? So it becomes a real onerous burden, number one, uh, for prosecutors and the police that have to stay with the prosecutors as a case is going through the courts. That sometimes takes years now. Uh, so, you know, it's definitely a resource issue, but it also disclosure is also, um, you know, complicates things that the massive amounts of disclosure, because uh, there's another Supreme Court of Canada decision, Jordan, which says that these cases have to be prosecuted within 30 months at the Supreme uh -huh. Court level. So they're almost incompatible or inconsistent, right? Because the amount of disclosure requires all this time, but you have to have the case done within a specific time limit, right? Well, the other piece, I think you, uh, tell me if I've got this right, but I think I remember reading, you were saying it's sort of a barrier to international collaboration that like other countries actually don't want to share information with Canada because of Stinchcomb and I, Stitchcomb, sorry. And is that... Um, like, is Canada kind of on its own in having this threshold for disclosure for the defense? And clearly it's not aging well. Is there any appetite to revisit this? Well, it should be. I mean, you would need legislative changes. And yes, that's exactly it. So, you know, if uh, authorities in Australia have some evidence from, you know, confidential informant, uh, you know, they want to give that to Canada. If there was going to be a prosecution in Canada, that would have to be disclosed uh, that could jeopardize things, you know, for that person in Australia or just other kinds of intelligence that uh, other jurisdictions, particularly within the five eyes, you know, so that's Australia, New Zealand, uh, Canada, the UK and the United States. We definitely have, uh, you know, broader disclosure in Canada than in those other jurisdictions. So what ends up happening is, you know, they decide not to prosecute in Canada if a crime has been committed in more than one jurisdiction, right? They'll maybe go after them. You know, we, we've seen that. Uh, the perfect example was, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, we had this really extraordinary uh, case announced by uh, the U.S. DOJ, Department of Justice, uh, where, you know, a Hells Angel, who I know very well, Damian Ryan, uh, from B.C., of course, uh, he's in jail in Winnipeg on a massive drug importation case that's yet to go to trial. And he's accused of working with an Iranian drug lord uh, named Naji Zindastri uh, to um, kill two political dissidents in the United States. So um, Zindashti, you know, has these connections in Canada. So there you look at the transnational organized crime links. Uh, but he's also doing the dirty work of the Iranian regime, you know, so you have kind of, I, I mean, it's it, the political overtones are really, really frightening, right? But I mean, uh, Damien Ryan has been linked to other uh, murder for hire cases, though he hasn't faced charges before. Now he's being charged in the United States. But um, his involvement, you know, through this encrypted communication that was hacked uh, by uh, the FBI in the United States, 
he would have been in Canada for much of that, but he's not facing any charges related to that in Canada. He's been charged in the United States, right? And the encryption company, interestingly, was a yeah. bank yes. company. Yes. Uh, and of I course- I was going to ask you to yeah. mention that if you didn't. Yeah, no, <laughs> the head of that company is facing charges in the United States, though he is fighting his extradition and has been for a couple of years now. So, you know, again, it, it all goes to illustrate how involved we are at the international level. Uh, Damien Ryan, like, grew up in East Vancouver, started getting into trouble as a kid. Uh, he has an uncle that's in the Hells Angels. It's hard to imagine that he's become such an international player, but he has. But can we just stop at, at Abbotsford again or go back briefly? Because maybe you should, this is a good point to tell people a bit about a case you didn't work directly on, but it's certainly relevant, which was Cameron Ortiz, the top uh, amb uh, Abbotsford raised uh RCMP intelligence officer who was trying to sell secrets to another one of the encrypted phone companies, if I understand the story correctly. Yeah, Vincent Ramos, who I did actually break the original story about Ramos because, um, you know, again, a Vancouver guy facing charges in the United States for running this business. Uh, so many of his phones were actually sold in Australia and were linked to murders, like communications on the devices, uh, you know, were... Uh, being made to commit murder for hires there as well between rival uh, biker or bikey gangs, as they call them in Australia. Uh, so, um, yeah, Ortiz reached out to Ramos and uh, offered to sell him, you know, uh, secret intelligence from RCMP files in exchange for money. Interestingly, it doesn't look like uh, or uh, Ramos took him up on that. Ramos has just about finished his uh, eight-year sentence in the United States, and we'll be back in Canada soon. Um, but yeah, Canada's really, in Vancouver in particular, has really been, you know, at the top of creating these encrypted devices that are used around the world by organized crime. Were there not some links, again, to uh, international terror organizations that Ramos's client list? Uh, not Ramos, but I mean, the other people that um, he was trying to uh, sell the intelligence to were, um, was an Iranian um, based Ontario based money laundering organization. Uh, so I, it was extremely troubling and disturbing. He didn't seem to care at all. That would be a great interview to get right. We still don't really know his motivation. You know, was it money? Was it ideological? Uh, so many, you know, so much information came out in that trial but there's also a lot that we don't know and probably i don't think we should let you go without getting your reflections on the uh shooting of hardeep nijar which mm. which was a part of the whole long story that you pioneered and and basically wrote up the book on in terms of the air india bombings and the role of Khalistani extremists here in uh, in british columbia can you tell us what you take what your take is on, on that whole situation which has got national consequences as well well, it's obviously extremely disturbing if the Indian government had any role to play, as it is now alleged, and I think documented through the U.S. prosecution. Yet again, we learn more from U.S. court files than we ever learn uh, in our own country. Uh, but I, I think you'll end up seeing that when charges are laid, there'll be a lot of local people involved. I don't think it's a matter of hitmen flying in from outside the country. Uh, but, you know, that's been a challenging political situation for decades here in B.C. We've seen violence before, uh, but, you know, we've never seen, as alleged, the Indian government having a role uh, in someone's murder. So very, very disturbing. Um, I hope we get all the information because my experience in covering murder for hire cases is that, again, we don't aim for the top people. We you know, as soon as they get the hitman and uh, the hitman go on trial or they plead guilty, they never have to disclose, even if they get a deal in the prosecution, who in fact hired them if they know. So, you know, you've got uh, one of the Air India suspects who was acquitted, Raputaman Singh Malik, who was uh, murdered in July of uh, 2022. And uh, there are two alleged hitmen uh, who are yet to go to trial, but they had no direct connection to Malik. Someone else hired them. Do we see anyone else being charged? No. Uh, and then you have Nidger's murder uh, a year later. Uh, same thing. I worry that we'll only see the people directly responsible for the shooting charged and never know the whole backstory, which would really be a disservice to the community to not have that information public. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So one one more thing before before we let you go, I, I did want to because it, it was in the news last week, and I think ties together a lot of what you're pointing to um, in the in um, in the struggles to kind of deal meaningfully deal with this t- issue. Um, and I'm thinking of the the collapse of the um, largest ever uh, fentanyl case in BC. Um, Thirty million dollars worth of fentanyl seized in an investigation called Project Julia. Um, and I understand, so that um, actually collapsed because there was an investigator involved who was found, um, who was found to be uh, sharing information. Or can you explain a little bit about what happened there? And is it the fact that the case collapsed on on the fact that they kind of had to stop and restart the investigation? Is that typical in other jurisdictions? You know, I didn't actually cover this case, so I mean, I know. Uh strokes but it's not you know i don't really have all the details beyond that there's now going to be a review and investigation of what happened but yeah often one piece goes missing from um you know the prosecutor's uh evidence uh and they stay the charges in the case so i've seen it happen many times i mean the the biggest example here in bc is the silver international money laundering case right which was the biggest ever money laundering case in canadian history and, uh, you know, with no kind of forewarning, uh, the prosecution was just dropped, right? And we still never got an explanation from uh, the Ministry of the Attorney General as to why that happened, you know, just broad strokes that, you know, was no longer in the public interest to go forward. Uh, interestingly, what often happens when these cases collapse is there is violence afterwards. So one of the accused in the Silver International money laundering case ended up being murdered, um, you know, within a year. Uh, and now there's two alleged hitmen facing charges in that case, right? So, um, but no, the Juliet one was, you know, that was a major investigation and for charges to be stayed, you know, was was pretty outrageous, but so was the alleged conduct of the officer. Uh, from what I've read, like I said, I didn't directly cover that case uh, myself because I was busy with this project, mm. uh, you know, but uh, definitely a disturbing one. And I think we'll um, get more information from the Ministry of the Attorney General, because there has to be some kind of public explanation for what happened. Kim, uh, you mentioned this project, which, as I said at the beginning, is really an extraordinary one, but was helped a lot by uh, a fellowship or grant you received from the Lieutenant Governor's Office. Can you speak as a journalist uh, about what your hopes or fears are for the coverage of these really important issues as we see these colossal upheavals in the in the media industry and in journalism generally? What What's your... Are we going to learn anything about this down the road if we don't have people like you? Probably not. You know, I mean, it was a great opportunity to be able to get the fellowship, which subsidized my travel. You know, I wouldn't have been able to go to all these places. Um, you know, I didn't mention Fiji. You mentioned Australia, but like to Fiji, I heard there was this, um, you know, kind of uh, critical problem with methamphetamine use and it was heartbreaking and a huge Canadian involvement in methamphetamine landing in Fiji and having devastating social effects, you know, and other, so it, it was, it, you know, was um, really unbelievable and eye-opening, even though I felt I knew a fair amount before I left, I never would have been able to get those on the ground stories, you know, going to Vietnam and trying to track our BC guys that are now headquartered there. Um, yeah, it was, it was an extraordinary opportunity and, I fear that, um, you know, unless we have even more fellowships available to people, uh, that um, we're not going to see this kind of deep dive in journalism much, except maybe like the Globe and Mail does it. Uh, sometimes the CBC does it. Um, you know, we just lost W5, right? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. doing that kind of work uh, forever. So, you know, again, we're talking about trying to make Canadians care about things they don't care about what's happening to the media in general. It's really upsetting, right? And, you know, even some of the newer models that we thought would be great, you know, we had all the websites started by Overstory Media, then they mm-hmm. start a bunch of people off. So um, I don't know, I, I'm very fearful for the future. I do hope if I ever get to retire that I will spend time trying to create new models that work because journalism is so vital. Uh, and, you know, people are not going to know uh, how important it is until it's gone. You exactly. Know? That's a shame. Exactly. Exactly. It's hard to describe 
you know, like I think any journalist reading your piece um, would be reading it too with, um, I think for starters, Kim, like just the stuff you uncover, the threads you pull, the connections you make are fantastic. But I think the other lens would be just you you see how much resources and time and expertise it it requires to be able to make the connections that you do and see the big picture that you do and i it was such a pleasure to read it i thank you so much for your work um i want to applaud i also am grateful like the fact that it's public and there's no paywall so people yeah. can go read this investigation yeah thank you to the vancouver sun um I think this is uh, stuff people need to read. Uh, and it's almost like you have to read it to believe it um, and read it to support the kind of work that that, that you're doing, Kim, because it's just so, um, it, it's less and less of it and it's never been needed more. Thank you. Here, Thanks here. for talking about it and for caring. I really appreciate it. Guess I'm wondering if you can relate to this. I grew up near the US border and the car radio was tuned to NPR, we watched ABC News and sometimes Fox News in the evenings, but that's another story. The truth is, until a little over a decade ago, I knew Fahrenheit better than Celsius. Someone would casually drop the forecast for the weekend and I'd mentally drift away for a few seconds to do a rough estimate conversion. Whew, it feels good to confess that. Even though my weather-related vocabulary has been steadily improving, I never could have anticipated the steep learning curve of meteorological terms we'd all have to learn these past few years. We've been introduced to terms like atmospheric river, heat dome, and arctic outflow. Weather has gone from safe topic in any context to actually a pretty serious one. Premier Eby brought it up last week, raising the alarm about historically low snow basins and the increasing likelihood of record-breaking drought and wildfires this summer in BC. As a BC-based company with deep roots embedded throughout the province, this is an issue that has profound effects on TALIS. And connectivity is vital during natural disasters, including for those receiving emergency updates on their phones and those risking their lives as first responders. That's why, leaning on its world-class networks, TALIS is stepping up by investing in Dryad, a startup that specializes in early wildfire detection technology. Using TELUS's large-scale Internet of Things network, the sensors deployed by Dryad will be able to detect wildfires during the smoldering phase, alerting first responders within minutes of a wildfire starting. These sensors extend mobile network coverage so that they're capable of operating in remote regions, meaning they can reduce the risk of fires spreading out of control, prevent the escalating costs and environmental impacts of wildfires, and save lives. This is just another way TELUS is investing in the province to keep communities, emergency responders, and everyone else in this beautiful province safe. Hello, you've reached the Hotel Pacifico Strategy Suite. Welcome back, Mike. Thanks for joining us for this special edition of the Strategy Suite. It's an all throne speech strategy suite because we just can't get enough. Now, gentlemen, I, I want to take a minute and just like, because it, I just, safe space, it's just the three of us. No one's listening. How much, how much do these speeches from the throne actually matter? Can I start with you, Jeff? Well, I would say they're the largest effort for the smallest payback of any major event in, a, in the annual calendar <laughs> because it's immediately eclipsed by the budget. And there's a lot of protocol associated with it. And you've got to say some important things, but you don't want to say them and give everything away. So yeah. it's um, it's an important marker. It's kind of like the firing of the starting gun at a yacht race. Everybody's sails ruffle a little bit and the cannon fires and they go across the line, but nothing's really happened yet. Oh, I like that metaphor. Does that resonate with you, Mike? Uh, to quote Churchill or paraphrase Churchill, never before have so many written so much to entertain so few. <laughs> which is why the three of us are talking about this urgently now now uh, you know okay. I, am, I am familiar with a very entertaining throne speech about seven years ago that uh that had a lot of comment commentary uh but that's what another story for another for day so was really it was nicknamed the, the throne speech uh <laughs> A blueprint for a new generation uh in, which in my pub, sadly the clone speech which sadly uh, sadly yeah. was uh, not implemented but uh this throne speech uh, today the fifth session of the 42nd parliament thank you uh had some uh, wonderful uh, compelling language uh that uh we must meet the moment 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that we are working to build more connected systems of mental health and addiction care. Mm -hmm. I thought, wow, that's. I'm getting goosebumps. How about you? Uh, how many? How many years? <laughs> How many years are we into this government? Well, <laughs> We're still I mean, working on that stuff. To go back to the, I mean, in an election year, right? That's it's laying the case for government doing, you're either making the case for government doing more or less, right? Helping you out or getting out of the way. Like that's well, kind of the setup, right? Well, there is a there there are a few policy areas where you don't really have anything new to say and you just got to make it sound like it's new and it's not really new. So that's part of a throne speech as well. For sure. For but sure. I didn't see a ton of like, here is like Gordon Campbell was known for like throwing down the gauntlet in the throne speech and like seriously here comes the carbon tax, folks. Didn't see that coming. Yeah, my my favorite was ah. five great goals for a golden decade. He yeah, was channeling was wow. uh, channeling Deng Xiaoping or something, but uh, uh, yeah, no, they were big. The throne speeches were, are, were yeah were That's... were seen as a uh, a moment in the Campbell administration. Um, and there were some things laid down, but sometimes one year it was the heartlands. Mm -hmm. You remember the heartlands, Jeff? Yeah, that was where, uh, where the BC has heartlands. What is, we what? have heartlands. You yeah, don't live there, Kate. <laughs> you do, <laughs> Kate. You are nowhere near the heartlands. I assure you of that. You are nowhere near the heartlands. You've got to drive hours to get a cappuccino in the heartlands. Yeah, no. Okay. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> no. seen. Okay. You're drinking okay. Labatt Blue in the heartlands. Um, I don't like Labatt. It's okay. But that was the government's response to a growing problem in the interior of the province after they interior. made, mm -hmm. quite, as we talked about with Don Wright, quite a few mm -hmm. service cuts mm -hmm. in the 2001 2005 period. And um, the government espoused its love for the heartlands, which uh, did not make it into the next year's throne speech. But uh, it was a good, it was a good try. Okay. So then, you know, let's, okay, we've, we've, we've done the kind of tour of history, you know, it's, uh, you know, I, I will, I hope to revisit the halcyon golden days of throne speeches in the, in the Campbell era, but, you know, here now in fairness, um, we are in an election year and this is kind of the little, I would call it, it's, it's a bit of your pre-platform warm up, right? You got to lay the groundwork for the overall message. Um, the government's going to want to drive home in the lead up to, an election. Jeff, did you see any of that in this speech? Yeah, I broke it down a little bit into what I see there and what I didn't see there. Some of that stuff I didn't see, I didn't expect to see, but it was interesting also that it was not there. Okay. <laughs> um, and uh, so what I did see there was a ton of stuff about affordability and housing, including the Build BC uh, program announced really about a week ago with $965 million from the provincial treasury, but also two billion added this morning by the prime minister at a press conference with David Eby, which indicated what he wanted everyone to hear today. That he flew back to Victoria, I guess, for the throne speech. So this program is quite different because it uses public land and is targeted to a certain income group. And I think we'll see the government seek to tie its electoral fortunes very tightly to this missing middle group of people who work hard, uh, do everything right, and uh, still can't afford to buy a home. That was very much the rhetoric in there. What Another thing I saw there was a ton of discussion about climate change from the standpoint of infrastructure. They mentioned Cedar LNG. Uh, they mentioned hydrogen. Uh, this is, I think, uh, taking a page from uh, the Biden administration's discussion about climate change from the standpoint of jobs, investment, and innovation. So the uh, there was a passing mention of the... Um, fact that our emissions are down 5% on the latest measures of so the plan is working. And then a big discussion about all the stuff we're going to do to continue to be green. Um, a discussion about healthcare, of course, and some work on the crime front. I'm just going to talk briefly about what was not there. Um, there wasn't a ton of discussion about reconciliation, which I think is the first time since this administration was really mm -hmm. hardly mentioned. Mm -hmm. So I would, um, I would not uh, double down my bets on the passage of the Land Act in this session of the legislature. Well, that's a good point, trouble. Jeff. They didn't, they didn't bring mm -hmm. up the Land Act per no. se. Well, there uh, wasn't there even was language a... there that would cover the Land Act. It was well, just like an empty there category. Was a, there was something on DRIPA at the start. Yeah, the, well, there was certainly a lot of ceremony, but uh, the overdose crisis is now about treatment. Uh, there was yeah. no harm reduction discussion. Oh, you um, know, on the, on the overdose piece, Jeff, um, I noticed that there was a shout out to the coroner's report, which I thought was a little bit cheeky. Yeah, hmm. yeah. Um, considering what happened at that press conference, but yeah, and then nothing. Um, 
nothing woke, I guess. Um, and it's a vast category, but nothing that would uh, rankle anybody. It's also on the present side in the front bench, although I'm not sure uh, where if that'll be a permanent location for was Selena Robinson recently dropped from cabinet after the uh, disaster we discussed last week about uh, Gaza, her remarks on Gaza, but also uh, the outcry that occurred in the Jewish community. So the invocation was given by a rabbi. There was a shout out in the long list of British Columbians who were acknowledged at the beginning uh, to a man who, who died tending the wounded during the Hamas attacks. So I felt there was a bit of an effort to right the boat a bit with the Jewish community after Selena Robinson's uh, departure from cabinet. But that's just a footnote. Did she attend today? Yeah, she was there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's my quick summary. Hmm. Well, that's... At uh... Yeah. yeah. Well, I noticed that there was a shout out to Apollo Creed in the throne speech. Uh, they, in the in memoriam section, they actually acknowledge Carl Weathers, who passed away, who played Apollo Creed, who's American. So I thought <laughs> that, sorry, just random uh, Hollywood news uh, Why, in the throne speech. Does he have a connection to BC? He played for the BC Lions for <laughs> oh, okay. two years. I don't I don't and, think there's a wedge there for the opposition to exploit. And when I was in grade oh, twelve, <laughs> when I was in grade twelve, they did film Rocky Four at the Agrodome. Okay. So uh, there might they there might was be a ton, referring to I that. I forgot one thing that was there. Um, mm -hmm. And you, Mike, you've worked on these things, so you know this is tricky. There was contrast, which is inside politics speak for uh, knocking your opponents, not by name. Yeah. You can never do that through the mouth of the lieutenant governor, but quite a bit of how bad it would be to to bring in austerity at this time how much people rely yes. on health care mm -hmm. and so on so uh some language about about that a little bit of, a little bit of that pre-election pre maneuvering i would say happening in the throne speech yeah that's i think and i think to some extent that's you know that's kind of what you want to achieve with a with a throne speech like it's like you just kind of want to set the framework and the rubric because i mean really in terms of the coverage of this stuff you know, and we spend a lot of time on this podcast talking about the decline in mainstream media. It is those players who do, you know, one hit summary of it. And it's not much more like it's not living a lot on the channels we know people are more prone to spend their time on and consume mm -hmm. their news from. So um, I think, you know, it's funny to hear the two of you both. I'm really pleased that you both didn't try to pretend it's this high reward effort. Um, but I'd argue there's diminishing returns like. Yeah. I mean, I'm, we're recording later in the day, so I'm, I'm a little punchier than usual here. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it more than I like it. I like it. <laughs> but, I mean, we should address the fact of the timing of the throne speech is two days before the budget, and it's mm -hmm. usually the week before. Correct. So in the previous years, the throne speech did have a bit more runway. Yeah. Not that it was huge coverage, frankly, and I totally agree with Jeff uh, that uh, this is often a lot of importance put into it that is a bit unreciprocated by the public in terms of how interested they are. But mm -hmm. even still, in so much as they had this opportunity to have the media's attention and um, 200 other people in British Columbia today, I am a little surprised it wasn't more forward looking. It's a lot of it was a bit of back padding and look, look how, I mean, they don't say, look how far we as a government have come, look how far the people have come in mm -hmm. getting us through all mm -hmm. these things. But there was a bit, a bit of that, a bit of looking backwards on like all the um, successes uh, that they've decided to itemize. But where are you taking the province? Okay. Well, don't you think that That's... signals a tight budget, Mike? I mean, if you, yeah. you know, I, I yeah. of course deeply enjoyed and was exhilarated to hear all the achievements of the government, yes, I'm especially sure on the, affor so the hair, affordability yeah. side, but. There was no signaling there was more to come. And I think that's because uh, my hunch is the growth forecast is quite tight. So there isn't a lot of opportunity before the election to hurl a lot of more, more money on anything. So yeah. the, the announcement with the prime minister was timely. That's the other calculus. And I think that's some of what you know I'm hearing in both of you actually and how you dissect this. Because again, if you're if the public is not really the, the chief audience for this, after that, it's sort of your various stakeholder groups, the other interested parties who might be looking to the budget to get or not get something. And to some extent, you're laying the groundwork for, sometimes you're setting something up, sometimes you're actually kind of prepping people like, you know, get ready, it's not going to be the, it's not going to be the pony you asked for. Well, we all know that the number one issue in the polls is affordability. So it is has its, has its little section in the throne speech, helping people and families with costs. And the showpiece measures here are a 
$100 credit on BC Hydro bills, BC Family Benefit and Climate Action Tax Credit. And there's nothing new there. Um, and they even finishing off the section, go back to that old chest, Bob Dewar's old chestnut, uh, the Portman tolls. Mm -hmm. And so oh, it's no, like, it's, a, hmm, it's evergreen that one. The, the story, uh, so the story is not exactly fresh there. Um, so, you know, maybe they've got a few tricks up their sleeves in the budget, but do uh, they need so a fresh they, story? Right. Like let's set up the budget. Then well, too. it's like, a number one. It, well, it's a number one issue. Affordability is number one issue in the polls and, mm -hmm. and the government doesn't get great marks on it. So I would say it's a vulnerability, a weakness, um, that I'd pay a little bit of attention to, but it doesn't so, necessarily so have to question, be explicit question, in the throne speech. So. Give some free advice to Kevin Falcon, who may already have responded. I don't know, but, uh, what does he do here? Uh, does he fight with Rustad or does he fight with uh, EB? Um, if you're sitting where he is in this very difficult poll situation, what does he do with uh, the first debate? He's got to set the tone in his response, even though even fewer people will hear it than hear the throne speech. In the throne speech response? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and his yeah. his response was like he did. And I, you know, and it was sort of what I heard from him was, oh, it's a lot of flowery language and and nothing really, which I, is actually fair, um, right? Would be a fair assessment of it. I think, again, there's a little bit of thinking through who your audience is in this speech and sort of what's the objective then for Falcon. And then really, you know, I'd say the budget is more the case where he's going to have more opportunity yeah. to call them out. Well, I, I think Corey tonight got good advice last week where he says, talk about the future, talk about what you're going to do. You know, don't talk about, you know, yesteryear. I think um, Kevin Falcon probably does lean on his experience a little much. Uh, I think he's got to be aspirational. He's got to talk about these are the problems I see in BC and here's how I can fix them and establish himself as a, as a premier in waiting as opposed to um, a, a conservative leader who I, I don't think he, he may be higher in the poll. He is higher in the polls. But does he, does he look like a premier in waiting? Um, you know, if I were Falcon, I'd at least play that card. I'd at least try to leverage the fact that I'm the official opposition leader and have MLAs behind me. And I have more fulsome set of policies and stronger candidates. And and just try to power through the issue with the polls right now until he can see some sunlight on the other side of that. A little yeah, less I heard scrappy. Don, Don a little... Wants. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Diane, Diane Watts, who's co-chair of the campaign, I think is her title, uh, was on uh, the CBC this week, but she didn't have a message. She was waiting for the budget. She wanted to see the deficit reined in. There's too much spending out there. Um, she was very much on a retro kind of austerity kind of tone, and and I don't think that's going to cut it. I think Mike's uh, got a much better track for them. Uh, Rustad's uh, free of many constraints. He can say almost whatever he wants and get away with it right now. So his response would be interesting as well. All right. Well, so let's use this. Let's use our own advice too and cast forward a bit. Um, I do want to ask you both, what, you know, does this leave you looking for anything in particular uh, in the budget, Mike? Well, I'll be interested. Uh, I'll be interested to see what the fiscal position of the province is and uh, how they're planning to manage debt in the future. Not a terribly sexy issue, but I think it does go to state of mind in terms of um, kind of the next four or five years and uh, what they're out, you know, how they plan to handle a challenging fiscal situation and a darkening economy. Uh, I'll be also, also be looking to see how are they going to deal with the resource economy um, going forward. They need the resource economy to carry the freight. As Don Wright said a few weeks ago on our podcast, resource economy is still paying the bills in British Columbia. So might they need to um, allow the resource economy to play uh, the contributing role it's able to do and pay some of those bills so they're not having to borrow, borrow more money from future generations. So I'll be interested to see some of the policy choices they're signaling and um, what some of their uh, underlying assumptions are. What are you be looking for, Jeff? Well, I think the challenge for the government is execution and the completion of plans. And there was a reference there in an anecdote from a woman I presume a real person, but we don't know the whole name, her whole name, uh, who's now saving a thousand dollars a month due to childcare, which is very popular and very helpful mm -hmm. and has a great economic impact. The plan for mm -hmm. childcare was 10 years long. 
there's a, a number of people who have ten dollar a day child care and a lot who don't and some who have not no support at all what is so, the what is what is the uh the uh, ratio of those who have it and those who don't do you think? i don't have it at my fingertips but a lot have it at 10 uh and many 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 and more a lot don't. don't have it at 10 yeah exactly yeah yeah so i think part of the challenge for the government is to make those gains tangible people have heard about them they think they're happening but they're not happening fast enough i could give you all kinds of reasons why they're not happening fast enough including the pandemic but the bottom line is will there be uh, an effort to deliver on existing commitments which is kind of what the throne speech is saying everything is about or will there be an attempt to create some new commitments with what is, I think, some limited fiscal room? And, and then how far, to Mike's point, are they prepared to go to challenge some of the fiscal um, conservatives around who don't want to see any additional spending? And would it make a difference if they did commit to it? Those are all uh -huh. the questions that they're going to have to deal with in the budget. Big challenge for uh, Katrine Conroy is very capable, but it's a very, very tough job to do the budget speech at the best of times for anybody. And do it right before an election is uh, is especially so. So uh, she's got her hands full in the next couple. What's of days. interesting to me, Jeff, is that uh, the Vancouver Board of Trade is having the budget address on Friday in Vancouver, and it's being delivered by the Premier, not the Finance Minister, mm -hmm. which has usually been customary to have the Finance Minister deliver it. So that's um, a continuation of an approach to put the Premier front and center on all the major issues. And I recognize that Minister Conway is not. A household name and is not a you know i'm hearkening back to an earlier day when you know uh it was very difficult for a certain premier of the day to share the spotlight with a certain finance minister because of the the ownership of turf <laughs> obviously minister conway doesn't have much of an issue with it perhaps but it's still interesting that the premier's leading these things and he's leading a lot of things and we're not seeing the ministers lead things that they normally used to lead so. Yeah, that's right. And I think uh, Ravi Kalan was in the House while the Premier, uh, which was normal for the Premier to go to an event with the Prime Minister. But you would, the scheduling of it struck me as, as remarkable, really, the morning of the throne speech in Vancouver. It all worked, but uh, it indicated the significance and importance the government places on us housing affordability. Hmm. We will come back to these excellent questions and these excellent topics in two days where um, Listeners, you heard it here first. Um, it'll be a budget with a ghost of chiefs of staff's past. Um, we welcome all your Dickens references. If you bump into these two gentlemen, I'm going to miss it. I'm sorry. I'm helping a family member in Ontario, but these two gentlemen will be there. Please say hi. We love hearing about hearing from our listeners on Hotel Pacifico. So, um, and gentlemen, have a have fun. And then we will do a quick budget debrief the day of on Thursday. So expect that to drop on Friday for your is there, all is there your... a haunted haunted wing of Hotel Pacifico. <laughs> yes. It was eleven fifty two p.m. on January twelfth, twenty twenty four, when I arrived in Vancouver after a week of aloha. As I walked breezily out the arrival store at YVR, a wall of frozen air punched me right in the face. Pro tip: check the forecast before you arrive from Hawaii in a t-shirt. While I was unprepared for this wintry cold blast, our sponsor, Fortis BC, was working overtime to ensure BC residents were not left in the cold. On that day, Fortis BC delivered twice the energy of BC's electricity system, and at 21,763 megawatts, showed us all how much we rely on diversified energy pathways. The thing is, gas customers like you and me have invested billions of dollars over the years into building the infrastructure that delivers gas to our homes and businesses across BC. That paid-for infrastructure allows gas to reach us reliably, safely, and affordably. Like when that cold snap caused me to snap at YVR. Why did I leave my coat in my suitcase anyway? There will be another January 12th, hopefully not too soon, and Fortis BC will be there for us with a diversified approach that builds on the strengths of our gas and electricity delivery systems and helps us meet provincial emissions reduction targets towards a clean energy transition. Hotel Pacifico may be heated by its own hot air, but Fortis BC is there when we need it. Energy for a better BC and a better podcast. Let's raise a glass or take a shot. Time to raid the mini bar. I was surprised but delighted this morning to see there was a mini cabinet shuffle in addition to a massive announcement in Ottawa and a throne speech. And that was uh, George Chow plucked off the back benches and put into citizen services and Lisa Bear promoted into the vacancy caused by the departure of Selena Robinson of post-secondary education. So 
uh, both uh, very capable mm -hmm. people and uh, great uh, utility players can be can do anything wherever they are sent and asked. And uh, so congratulations to them. I, like that. I had not heard that as a matter of fact. So yeah. George Chow, is he running again? Obviously. I would think so. Obviously. Wow. <laughs> I think this would be the sign. Yeah. Wow, I'm Top surprised. indicator, yeah. yeah. No, he's he, he's retired two or three times, Mike. So never count him out. He's uh huh. but he's uh he's he's very safe in that seat, I think. All right, uh, I'll uh, yeah. Okay. Well Are you okay? I wanna uh you wanna... no, I wanna drill down on that a little bit with Jeff. Oh, okay. So he's in Fraser View. Right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, as of today, he's safe in that seat. But traditionally, that's a pretty swing seat. And and he's a he has proven that he can win the seat. Obviously, he's a very he's a he's Strong easy to underestimate, seat. my friend George. Yeah. yeah. But he's an older guy, so it just it, you just call. What me do you mean by that? Mike? I don't I don't follow that comment. He doesn't have <laughs> your fine head of hair, Jeff. But uh, few of us do. Uh, but. No, I just, you know, I think on brand for EB is going younger, right? And uh, uh, I'm just, a, uh, I mean, hey, nothing against having a few old fellas uh, kicking around in the cabinet, but I'm just, you know, when he had a chance to, here's a guy who's been around for a few terms, he had a chance to go with a rookie like Robbie Palmer or somebody like that. It's like, huh, interesting fork in the road. So just saying. Just now, saying. The question just is just how saying. hard do you lean on someone to, uh, you know, when, uh, I mean, Kevin Falcon kind of, showed the door to point it to the door when Mike DeYoung made a comment about Pierre Polyev and said, you know, those, those thoughts aren't welcome here. And now we see Mike DeYoung almost certainly going for a conservative seat. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think you're also pointing, uh, and you have in previous comments, Mike, to an interesting phenomenon, which is that there are not only a lot of people running again who, um, you know, we could name a list who are not, but so mm -hmm. far everybody seems to be running again. And nobody seems to be contesting nominations. So the appointments are happening, you know, uh, certainly on the BC United side, and we'll see what happens on the NDP side. They, the incumbents are staying, so there's no need for a nomination and no need for an appointment. Mm -hmm. But on the BC United side, the conservative side, the candidates are being appointed, which is all sort of odd. There was a day when incumbents had to run for their own nomination. In mm -hmm. fact, I think in the conservatives, conservatives federally, they're, they, they're not completely safe whereas uh, other parties have just rubber stamped them. And Jeff, if I, I'm going back in the time machine again, I believe the last Emily to lose her nomination in the NDP was Chris Darcy, Ross and Trail. Oh, yeah. People are, well, there are nominations, but it comes usually withstand the attack. Yeah. Yeah, he lost, and that was Katrine Conroy's husband who won that nomination. Mm -hmm. There mm -hmm. you go, a little trivia. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. But on that point, since we're going down that rabbit hole, uh, here is a list of BC Liberal BC Liberals who served in the legislature who knocked off incumbents in a nomination meeting. Kevin Falcon, Barry Penner, Colin Hansen, and uh, Jeff Plant. And I, it's hard to imagine the Gordon Campbell years in government without those four individuals in cabinet. And they all got there because they knocked off uh, an MLA in the nomination meeting. So um, anyways, that's why, you know, sometimes... And Mike DeYoung also knocked off someone in a nomination meeting who was not an MLA, but who was the party's favorite. So sometimes the locals uh, get it right. Hmm. Well, the they, party, they did when they picked George always... Heyman over me. I'll show you my scars. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a story for another day. Um, okay, so this mini bar is taking a long time, Kate. Yeah, I know. I know. Well, together. I try to wrangle you guys, but now it's just yeah. like it's I've a always lost been dipping cause. into the mini bar. We're just drilling down time. on poor George Chow, but there's nothing to drill down on. He's great. Uh, no, I he look. <laughs> hey, uh, you know what we were going to talk about today, and we didn't get around to it. Maybe we can talk about it next time. Is the mm. Richmond uh, uh, supervised injection site I controversy? Know. I know. And. Um, it made me think about George Chow, but we'll get into that some we'll, other time. We will come back to it, yeah. Um, but today, I have a shot to the city of Port Moody. Hmm. I heard on the radio machine today that the, or maybe it was global, I, I don't know where I heard it, that the city of Port Moody is considering joining the lawsuit to fight big oil. And I thought, oh, hmm. really? Within the municipal boundaries of the city of Port Moody are two oil refineries who have been paying property taxes for decades to the city of Port Moody. In fact, IOCO, which for those who don't know, stands for Imperial Oil Company, um, has been there for, I don't know, 
almost uh, 80, 90 years. And they're not refining anymore, but they're still still operating. And Suncor uh, has a refinery within the city limits of Port Moody too. So if you're going to sue big oil, shouldn't you well, really demand reparations from your own tax base? Because well, like, uh, big oil has been paying the bills in Port Moody for a lot no, of no, years. No, no, no. Maybe they it's should like, close the pool down. No, no, it's, know? A natural, <laughs> it's a natural extension of shop local, sue local. <laughs> sue, very nice. Sue local. sue local. Well, like... I assume the Port Moody pool is uh, heated by natural gas. So uh, I'm assuming they should, uh, in protest, um, uh, shut it down <laughs> while sending back the property taxes, maybe to a neighboring jurisdiction who might uh, want to use it. So anyways, I just thought, like, this is getting silly. I mean, give me a break. <laughs> All right. We'll be back later with your Kit Kat. I stick to your knitting municipalities, please. Uh, Stick to your knitting. I refer all questions to Brad West. Oh wow! They have they have less they have less knitting now that the zoning has all been fixed. That's oh, right. Yeah, 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 they have no more public hearings. They can just go super Time on their hands, Mike. Okay. Time on their okay. hands. Okay, okay. You two are on fire. We're not filming. We're not going to tape this late. Like I mean, or if we're going to tape this late, we're going to just have to allow for longer episodes because it just you're unstoppable. Well, then get on with the game. <laughs> All right, my my on with it is my glass raised. Uh, it's a this is an esoteric one. This is a glass raised to a parent who stood up in a town hall with the premier last week. I think Brian Martins was his name, part of like the Langley Parent Council. And God bless that fearless soul. He actually stood up and spoke up in defense of cell phones in schools. And I have to say that is a brave move because you got like the old, the old, all the boomers and the X's are like, no, no, they shouldn't be in the school. And then all the kind of newfangled parents who want their kids to play with wood toys are like, no, no, like screen time is bad. And it takes a brave soul to articulate the case that actually these things can be useful learning tools. So uh, I just am inspired by the bravery of that man and grateful for his comments. He was in the he throne was, speech. He was not speech. mentioned no! in the throne speech. Was he? <laughs> no, he well, was not. But the cell not. phone issue was and a, a promise to hold the social media companies accountable. I'm not sure what that means. Oh, okay. That's a different thing. Yeah. Another okay. lawsuit. Okay. I missed that. Okay. That makes mm. sense. All right. That is another fantastic special uh, throne speech episode of Hotel Pacifico. Thank you so much to our guest, Kim Bolin, for joining us. Thank you to our presenting sponsor, Talis, and to sponsor Fortis BC. And uh, we'll see you next week, if not even in a couple days. Guests, BC, you can never leave. Check out time at Hotel Pacifico. We hope you enjoyed your stay.